there is a very strong judgment in saying, oh, this practice, it's more mature than the other practice. Why? Why is mm -hmm. that? It means really introducing a strong bias into it. So the way in which I use the map is just uh, like um, a scope or a perimeter mm -hmm. in which uh, uh, inviting organizations to do sense making. So at the end, it doesn't matter if you are on the right, on the left, on the middle. Yeah. For me, what, what matters is that you're asking yourself that question. So, great to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Um, so, Emmanuel, we got together today to, um, what well, it was following a, a recent article you published where you were exploring uh, sociocracy, holacracy. Um, and this was in the context of the human organization map, um, which I think is great, by the way. And uh, we had a brief conversation afterwards through LinkedIn and said, well, let's get together because you'd mentioned about your interest in S3, but that you hadn't looked into it so much at that point. And I jumped in and said, well, let's get together and have a chat. So that's how we came to be here today, right? Um, and um, I was thinking maybe first of all, to kind of invite you to follow your curiosity um, and um, to kind of frame it a bit, just saying something about the human organization map as well. And some of the reflections that you were making in that article, looking at holacracy and sociocracy, and maybe that can lead us in to a conversation more about S3, some of the common ground and some of the differences and so on. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. happy to, great idea. Uh, let me start from what uh, uh, hasn't been captured in the recording, because I think it's a good intro to what we are going to say. Yeah. Uh, why, why I'm doing this at the end? Why uh, have I built this or worked on this? I think the my main answer is building bridges. So it's not providing uh, precise definitions or building walls between uh, the traditional Socratic method SCM and uh, what other people are doing or what S3 is doing or what Alacrity is doing. I think the connections are clear. What I see is that uh, on one side, uh, mostly on the client side, there is a lack of awareness about uh, the, even the important uh, differences in the principles, the background and the goal, the different movements have, mm -hmm. not just the practices. Uh, on the other side, I see on the other side, really the opposite side, I see even too much attention of consultants in saying, oh no, this is not, uh, you know, the orthodoxy of uh, sociocracy or, or allocracy or something else. Why well, I think that at the end, the common ground uh, is often uh, bigger than what we would like to, to, to believe. Mm -hmm. So my own reason for uh, getting started with this work, this work was building bridges and trying to increase the awareness about both the differences and the things in common and having conversations. So at the end, I don't think I have any answer. I wanted to use this as a nice breaker and uh, as a way to start conversation. So I'm very happy to be here because I'm very curious about S3. Uh, I know just a bit, not much, so happy to be here, but I think this is already a step in that direction. Uh, so going really to your question, uh, the human organization map is, is an attempt to, not to invent anything new actually, but to pull together hundreds of different pieces of work and experiences from real world organizations and to frame them into the best that uh, I, I was able to do. So it's not perfect, it's not comprehensive, but let's say a map, uh, providing uh, a tool for organizations to think about the different aspects that to me are really core in how we imagine organizations should play out in the world. 
also it's not just thinking about the internal side of the organization, the organization design. It's definitely broader than that. It's the role of business into, into the world and the, the meaning of business, uh, the role of individuals into businesses, uh, taking inspirations from what uh, mostly exists out there. Mm -hmm. Because what I've seen when I went through many years ago uh, through the alacrity training is that some dimensions, for example, the attention to, to the individual is somewhat lost. Or mm -hmm. anyway, it's an optional that you can add if you're good enough, but it's not, let's say, mandated, mandated by, by the framework. And every other framework, if you look at what Semco did or what Morningstar did or what Borzorg did, all of them come from a specific uh, background, a specific uh, uh, worldview, specific principles that are quite never made explicit to mm -hmm. those that are trying to use or copy and paste the tool. And uh, Agile or the, let's say, Spotify version of Agile is a great example in this because what they said is, this is not a framework. Please don't copy it. And every organization in the world started by copying it. So even mm -hmm. when there are the best intentions, well, organizations may not be ready or may not be willing or may not be aware, I don't know, and just copying it and applying it to a different environment. Just an example is Sweden and Italy. If you try to copy something that works very well in Sweden, it doesn't mean that it works in a totally different cultural and economic environment. Exactly. You may do that, but you may need to be aware about the differences. And this awareness for me, it's missing. So that's why I put together uh, this, this work. And then I started to apply it. And one application was exactly the one that you are describing. So at the end, uh, how is sociocracy uh, fitting into it? What's the difference between sociocracy and holacracy? And I don't want to go through all the all the past, but I think that uh, many comparisons in the past have been really at the superficial level of a socio-technical iceberg. So at the end, it's easy to look at, okay, how are we doing decisions or uh, how are we electing roles? It's much more difficult to compare the, the aim and the language and mm -hmm. the principles of the basis of the two systems. Mm -hmm. Just as, a, as an example that came from, I learned about it from an interview uh, with, uh, with Brian Robertson is uh, the meaning of governance. There is a core, a core topic, a core word in both sociocracy and holacracy is totally different. Mm -hmm. So at the end, sociocracy is meant mostly, I'm, I'm talking not about S3, I'm talking about, let's say, my understanding of, uh, say, traditional sociocracy is more uh, an approach for decision making, a specific type of decision making, and also a way uh, for, organize, for designing organizations in an emergent way. Mm -hmm. Alacracy is mostly a way to distribute power into the system. So at the end, the, the meaning of governance is very specific. It's very strict. It's, it has a very clear goal of distributing roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and domains in the organization as to achieve some aims. Mm -hmm. But this is not discussed ever. So at the end, you, if you look at uh, intersociocracy and alacracy, you expect the meaning to be the same the goal to be the same and you just focus on the important but most superficial aspects of the difference so yeah. my goal was really trying to raise attention on uh, on uh, on these important differences and then to enable everyone to pick or mix wherever they they wanted yeah well i think it's it's really important points you raise because on the one hand we've got different interpretations of the same terms um, and on the other, we've got different applications defined by the terms, depending on the framework. Um, so if you combine both of those together, then it's a bit hit and miss, whether you're understanding what you're meant to be understanding yeah. um, at all. So uh, the, something I'm curious about, you said about starting to apply the tool. How do you go about actually conducting an analysis? You know? 
like in a particular mm -hmm. organizational context or with a particular framework, can you say something about some of the steps yeah. you take to do that? Because that's a potentially kind of, uh, well, it's a, a difficult environment to measure in, right? And I'm very curious how you do it. Uh, let me start from uh, a recent uh, episode that happened. I've been contacted by an organization in Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, that was inspired by the map and said, can we build uh, an assessment on it? So can we build questions, uh, mm -hmm. a score to, let's say, in that case, position ourselves against the map? And, and I, I understand this is, a, let's say, a very common basic uh, reverse. So, you mm -hmm. know, you have two, a number of polarities. Uh, uh, there should be a way to say, I'm here or I'm there. <laughs> My answer has been, uh, no, I won't help you to do that. Yeah. Because I don't believe that the, the goal is going to the right or the goal is addressing all the dimensions. And uh, going back to Edgar Schein, I don't think uh, uh, anything like an overall assessment, he was talking about culture, but uh, mm -hmm. an overall assessment uh, uh, really exists unless mm -hmm. you have a clear question in mind. Uh, and then that means that you're going to answer that question. You're never going to do uh, an assessment on, on the entire map. So. Mm -hmm. Actually, I tried to do that based on that request, and uh, I struggled. So uh, there is a very strong judgment in saying, oh, this practice, it's more mature than the other practice. Why? Why is mm -hmm. that? It means really introducing a strong bias into it. So the way in which I use the map is just uh, like um, a scope or a perimeter. Mm -hmm. in which uh, uh, inviting organizations to do sense making. So at the end, it doesn't matter if you are on the right, on the left, on the middle. Yeah. For me, what, what matters is that you're asking yourself a question and then finding your answer. And the answer could be no, I don't want to think about this dimension. Let's say purpose or let's say ownership. Maybe I'm not into that. I'm looking at more basic things and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at least uh, making, asking yourself this question and then uh, having a conversation that is a collaborative conversation. It's not something uh, any individual person will assign a score to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then designing uh, in an iterative way a flow, a journey, not a transformation step, not a transformation project uh, to ultimately go towards an adaptive organization. Mm -hmm. As my friend Zara would say. So at the end, uh, I don't think I have an answer and I don't think anybody has an answer because there is no answer. At the end, the goal is not uh, reach, reaching uh, a destination. Mm -hmm. It's uh, about enabling the emergence into the system and dancing with the system to let the system evolve itself. Sure. So at the end, the map is just, uh, you know, an invitation to explore. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great conversation starter. You know, we've got the seven principles that we made explicit in S3. I, there's many, many more. Um, and often we'll invite a conversation, just inviting people to reflect on the degree to which they think any of those particular principles is alive and expressed in the organization. And then a secondary element to that is looking at to what degree might it be useful to bring that in more or, or less maybe. And what's fascinating for them is it's not about it's not the the gut, it's not the uh, the outcome, but it's the conversation that's most valuable because depending on which aspect of the organisation you're looking at, which area within the organisation, and so on, and even people with co-located in the same team have very different understandings and perspectives on this. Um, so it's the conversation itself that yields the most value, um, rather than. Well, I like the, it. I like it a lot because at the end, what I'm doing with organisations is. Uh, Having a conversation at the organizational dimension level, at the mm -hmm. end, uh, we need uh, to improve our way of uh, making decisions, or we need to. We feel that we need to, uh, to, to 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 need a way to distribute information to increase the transparency, and then you can stick practices to it. So yep. let's say you have uh, I call them change seeds. It's really a seed. You don't know. You have a soil, you have the water, you have the light, but you don't know if it is going to be a big tree or just a small plant or nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just the planting a seed and experimenting with it and evolving the awareness of the organization along the journey. So 
the patterns, uh, as you call them, uh, uh, or the practices are really a way to help you with the exploration. Mm -hmm. On the other side, uh, uh, when I uh, looked into a lacrosse, and the same for sociocracy, I acknowledge that organizations are looking for shortcuts, right? So at the end, having uh, some kind of uh, uh, consistent, uh, I don't want to say comprehensive, but at least consistent approach, guided approach of mm -hmm. exploration makes it easier. So at the end, uh, looking for the pieces is much more intensive, complex uh, uh, than, than looking for just one street, one way, one, one pathway. Um, I believe every, every organization is different. So picking a system, any system, any framework, any approach is a very important choice. The map is actually about uh, having uh, informed decisions of this kind so maybe the approach is the right one for you maybe not mm -hmm. i would like to give organizations a way to think about this before jumping into any system the patterns are a bit uh, the opposite because you say okay no there is no big system or no big approach there are ingredients that you can cook yourself yeah yeah sure so i guess also this tool is useful if you do opt for a particular framework some kind of approach then it also gives you a way to reflect on the added value of doing so in those different dimensions that are laid out in the organization map and to be able to nail down specifically perhaps where adjustments to that that approach would be valuable yeah yeah an example of this is uh, uh what uh, ddos are are doing so if you look at how individuals draw develop themselves mm -hmm. into organizations in most cases there is not much it's just you know let's do some training uh, let's let's add some assessment and add some capabilities mm -hmm. uh, there is no systematic way mm -hmm. and no systemic way for the organization to nudge individuals to grow and mm -hmm. then there is a uh, bob keegan uh, that published a book uh, saying actually there is a way uh, there is a way that can help every individual. Actually, that could be the goal for any individual to grow within the organization. This is something that I quite always miss in any approach. Mm -hmm. So uh, having a deliberately uh, developmental organization, something that is not included in any approach, you mm -hmm. may want to add it. Or uh, sociography is a good example of how to 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 use consent uh, to open up uh, i don't want to say the ownership but let's say the representation of the mm -hmm. different uh, stakeholders of a firm but maybe adding a formal ownership approach such as steward ownership on that or becoming a b corp could empower the organization design uh, into the bylaws and into a purpose oriented perspective so at the end uh, having this overall view can help you focus where you feel the energy goes and uh, the need is instead of just picking one because there is no model that can address all the needs that the organization are going to have also because these needs are going to evolve every mm -hmm. day so it's theoretically impossible sure we're on the same page with that one um i had one other question on this so going back to your article um sociocracy on the human organization map uh, and there's uh if i scroll down the article there there's a section where you're laying out approximately where sociocracy maps onto that and i'm curious how you came about that whether that was as a series of conversations or how did you arrive at those um, conclusions so it's uh, there are different sources i may say uh, one is uh, uh, my direct experience of sociocracy Mm -hmm. uh, another one is conversations with other people into sociocracy mm -hmm. and uh, and the other another source uh, especially in terms of comparing the sociocracy and holography has been interviews that Brian Robertson did or hosts in different communities or other presentations and uh, my my feeling was that uh, let's say uh, 
a coherent description of the differences at different levels, not just the practices, but also some deeper levels was, uh, was missing. So I tried to put it together. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe at the end that any score, <laughs> to call it in terms of assessment, is definitely right. Uh, while doing this, I had done the same for literacy two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I realized that some of the scores that I assigned to literacy weren't really that precise. Uh -huh. uh, but to me, the point is not really to say it's 75%, it's 60%. It's uh, just uh, having a glimpse of the different perspectives. So uh, an example of that could be, uh, I don't know, information visibility. Uh, one could, could argue that at the end, the literacy is giving visibility. And it's true, because if you look at GlassFrog or other tools, you have visibility about uh, how um, responsibilities are shared. Mm -hmm. But you don't have necessarily visibility about uh, the operational activities. Instead, sociocracy is very clear about it. Transparency is one of the three principles. Yeah. Uh, so at the end, it's a, it's a choice in the method, and it's a choice that has to be, has to be recognized into, let's say, any... Uh, assessment or any evaluation that you have to do. Equivalence uh, in, in sociocracy is really important. So at the end, you want every voice to be, to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, this is a, a, a re revolutionary principle in most organizations. Mm -hmm. This is really uh, a radical in many organizations. So, so saying that everybody is equivalent in a traditionally hierarchical, top-down, common and control organization, it's like, you know, risking to, to be thrown out of the window. Uh -huh. So it's a small principle, but very far-reaching impacts that has to be, has to be expressed. And uh, another subtle way is, another subtle error is self-expression. Mm -hmm. You know, one could say, yes, everybody is able to speak up in my organization, but then Everybody with a bit of carpet experience knows mm -mm, that's not really the truth because if you speak up, your your head is going to be, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> cut here uh, because you don't conform, you are not aligned, you have a different culture. At the end, you are bringing all of yourself at work. Yeah. So, surrogacy has many practices addressing this. So, at the end, the answers come from my experience and conversations uh, I had. Uh, I'm learning as everybody else, so I'm sure there are mistakes or missing pieces, and even my own understanding, I hope, will evolve uh, in time. Maybe yeah. in this conversation. And um, it certainly kicked off a conversation, didn't it, in the in the comments below in your uh, in your article when you published yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay. So how about we turn attention then to Esri? Please. Um, so what jumped out for me was your your comment in that thread of conversation where you'd said you hadn't looked into it particularly yet and yeah. um, you were intending to and I thought well let's have that conversation um, and before I jump in with anything I'd be really curious to hear from you as someone who's looked at S3 from afar but with some attention over time like how would you sum it up um, you know if someone asks you well, what's S3 what's that about is and how is it different uh, from <laughs> classic sociocracy and so on? What might you say? That's a tricky question because, as I said, uh, I don't claim to have uh, enough experience, uh, real uh, world practice of S3. So, what yep. I'm going to say may be entirely wrong. So, sure. And let, then let me reassure you because my it's not so much a, a trick question, but I'm really curious to see how S3 landed with you yep. um, through the current. I think it's fair to say quite limited literature still, um, but just to, to get an impression of how it landed with you mm -hmm. um, and what interpretations you made. And then I can jump in on the back of that and, yeah. and build on what you've said or offer some alternatives and so on. So what really attracted me to S3 is first of all, the willingness to highlight, to bring to life some of the influences that are already somewhat implicitly there in sociocracy. Uh, so the, you know, the continuous improvement, the cybernetics, uh, even at the agile world, 
uh, main thing. I mean, there are a number of trends that have been going for the last 30 years, 40 years, that are with different names uh, mm -hmm. existing in any framework, even in Lycos. So at the end, bringing this to life, to me, helps really positioning uh, something that you don't know into something that you know. Mm -hmm. So it makes clarity. The other point, uh, and really the point that uh, pushed me away from Alacrosy is the idea of uh, having any monolithical approach and using it and uh, convincing the large organizations, those are my clients, to, to really, yeah, ingest it. And to think, okay, I'm going to, you know, to sign a constitution, to give up power, and then to change everything. And I say that because uh, patterns are, to me, quite the opposite of it. I'm giving you principles that provide coherence, but on the other side, I give you tiles, I give you patterns, I give you pick and cook however you want. So I really recognize this as a, a very valuable, valuable approach because I've seen even with traditional sociocracy, people adopting just rounds mm -hmm. or maybe trying only to, to have a meeting structure that has, you know, clarifying questions and reactions, but only that. Mm -hmm. And that's very easy, but it's already radical because in most organizations, this is not possible. So I really appreciate uh, both the coherence and then the loosely coupling that comes with the, with the, with the patterns. And uh, I also appreciate the diversity, let's say the different perspectives that uh, uh, probably fed in into the work that, that, that you did. This is my, let's say, high level oral uh, feedback uh, and interest, I must say, in S3. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for that. I don't know how accurate is that, but... <laughs> well, I think it's pretty good. I mean, I, I describe S3, one way of describing it is as a menu of behavior patterns that emerged in human collaboration over time and, and stuck around and evolved because of their usefulness in certain contexts. Um, and so I'm, I'm really on the same page with you that every context is unique, every organizational, every organizational system is unique and things are changing all of the time. And therefore, you know, we need to do what human beings have always done, which is adapt to changing context as well as we can with what we have and to seek out that which is new, which might help us to do it even better. Um, so, yeah. So this was very much the intention with uh, S3 to put together this kind of menu approach of modular patterns that, that complement each other. You, you can fit many together if you want, um, but to lead with the notion of starting where you are rather than lead with the notion of doing a whole bunch of things differently and then prioritize areas of need that you have in the organization and pick the top one or few and start there and and pull in what might help synergize it with all of the wisdom and experience you already have um, and try to run safe to fail experiments where you can so you can learn and evolve as you as you go uh, so the, the it became clear to Bernard and I, I met Bernard in 2014 and late 2014, we were having a conversation and he asked me, how many organizations do you know that over the long term stayed with an exact implementation of the sociocratic circle method? And I said, well, none that I know of, you know, they all adapted things somehow or other, more or less, and usually more than less. And um, he said that he'd observed the same in the agile world, you know, and working in the tech industry. Um, so we said, well, maybe we should just strip these things back and see what's under the hood, you know, and codify a bit the essential elements. Not all, because there's a whole bunch we chose not to mention, but um, codify those things for our own understanding and then share them with others. And um, quite recently, I, I came up with a phrase that the interface between the habitual and the new the potential for greater consciousness resides and mm. you know that's a it's a very obvious statement from one point of view but why it came to me in the context of s3 was i was seeing that it's not even about deciding to pull in a particular pattern and using it right that might or might not yield value but when you decide to 
experiment with a pattern that's different to the one you habitually do. Even if you just do that conceptually, then at that interface, one, you're beginning to understand the pattern you're looking at, but secondly, you're disidentifying from your habitual way of doing things. So you can also make that a bit more conscious too, and that gives you a much higher resolution perspective where you can examine the value of both, synergize where necessary, and then make a choice that really suits your particular circumstance, right? Rather than digging in, persisting with what you previously did and or making a pivot and, and or flipping to the other side and pulling in something entirely different. And for me, that's, uh, that's what I love about not S3. I mean, the patterns were there long before S3 was, right? It's just a means to an end to present it in this way. But that's what I love about bringing this perspective to people. And uh, because it, it frees people up to be able to examine alternatives in a non-threatening way and in a manner where they, they also can really acknowledge and appreciate what they've done previously till now, even if at this point that's an outworn pattern and it's bringing about more problems than itself. I have a question for you. Do yeah. you see the patterns as connected? So at the end, if you are exploring this pattern, you should also explore these other three, <laughs> how Amazon could say. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. There's some dependencies on certain patterns. So, I mean, an obvious one would be one of the process patterns, driver mapping. Um, driver mapping predicates on the concept of driver, uh, on the concept of domain. Um, there's a whole bunch of patterns in there, like uh, pr prioritizing backlogs, describing organizational drivers, uh, creating organizational structure and so on and so forth. So yeah, there's a, quite a big dependency between certain patterns. And that's actually been one of the uh, criticisms of the approach because as you were saying earlier in the call, people benefit from having a starting point. And one of the things that was missing in S3 was a starting point. Like is there a, a kind of bottom line framework that we can begin with and then kind of adapt according to our needs. And, you know, for some time we resisted that, um, mainly just to resist putting out, coming down anywhere and, and, and prescribing some way over another. But at this point, five and a half years into S3, we've seen enough evidence of common patterns that people pull in again and again in most organizational contexts. And if they don't, they pay a price for it. Yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, so we're, we're currently developing a framework which kind of represents some of those core patterns and more broadly speaking, some kind of practices that are typically valuable in any organizational context. So you can watch this space on that one because we'll be, we'll be um, launching something about that soon. I will, I will yeah. for sure. Yeah. And will, will that be a bit like going back to another sociocracy at the end, having a core set of patterns yep. and then a second level or a third level? How yeah. different will that be at that point? Yeah, sure. Of the patterns that you pick. Yeah, well, we, we said to people, take what works for you from S3. And we're kind of, uh, we're, we're applying the same principle to ourselves. So it's not that this would replace S3. S3 is a, a, a pattern-based menu, basically. Whereas the framework is really uh, pulling elements of that together and presenting it as something alongside S3. So it's a, one way to look at it would be a starting point for organizations that are dissatisfied with what they currently have. They're looking outside of themselves for answers and they're interested in S3. And a bit like I saw with the human organization map, you know, as a way to kind of look at your organization through these different lenses and determine in what areas you might need to develop. The framework is much more like this. It's really a, a set of practices um, that you might have more or less implemented already in the system. And you can use it as a kind of diagnostic to examine those different dimensions of organization and see if it would be useful to make changes or, or bring something into that particular area. So it's a, an, another level, let's say, connecting a sort of a, a web of links between patterns with suggested, let's say. Exactly. Yeah. 
yeah and and what was something else that struck me as very interesting so when i was reading your article on um socioxy through the lens of the human organization map and i looked at that that um visual of the the polarities and mapping socioxy onto it the sociocratic circle method stroke um sofa maybe more sofa um interpretation of socioxy than the sociocratic circle method per se i would say um but uh i realized i couldn't map s3 onto it at all <laughs> you know it was because in all of those dimensions it would depend on what was pulled in or not by people in that organizational content as to where that would fall on the scale but if i map the framework onto that well then it comes down definitely within a scope on all of those yeah um, and that was a, a realization for me as like ah, that's a, one way of understanding the difference between s3 and scm uh, uh, sociocratic circle method it's uh it's really is the code you know it's like you can put it together any way you like you can use it in just a just about any conceivable context provided perhaps people are no i wouldn't even say that is there an operating minimum i mean maybe the operating minimum is like the wish to collaborate mm -hmm. and an ideal operating minimum to get reasonable value out of it might be that people are willing to at least be reasonable you know my let's say the big difference also between the map and the alacrity is uh, is a bit of judgment that the map has i wrote it so at the end the map uh, the dimensions are neutral but you know the polarities are not mm -hmm. because on one side you find what i see today as the edge it doesn't mean that that's what you see or what others see or that really some you know extreme example out there air is one of them uh, mm -hmm. is really represented so at the end it's very it's very uh, biased or like i said at the end it could be it's really an operating system it could be used to do the opposite of what i believe uh, may be uh, good for mm -hmm. the world right now uh, yeah. so that's that's not really my my take but what you have done uh, with s3 at the end is uh, is really decomposing the pieces Mm. and really eliminating probably most of the judgment i don't know if all of the judgment uh, and saying okay these are the ingredients so there is no recipe here uh, maybe the recipe is getting uh, out now but so far there is no recipe so it's true at the end you are really decomposed to the minimum terms mm -hmm. let's say what is possible i don't th don't think that uh, there is a minimum viable let's say organization because it, it so much depends on the culture, on the readiness, on the context of the organization. Some organizations are very happy and satisfied to do a very small step. And maybe that's all they can do at a specific mm -hmm. point in time. Others really want to have something big to, to bite. And they're very brave, uh, maybe because of the crisis, because of other conditions. Mm -hmm. And it's good. So at the end, you can start from something very, very small or something uh, very big. And to me, already, this is an important decision uh, and something that I try to help organizations making based on their strategy. So at the end, my starting point working with, let's say, traditional organizations, not with startups, not with uh, necessarily very mature organization is connecting all of these to their strategy to their business to they what they want to achieve now mm -hmm. not in the future not changing the mindset but right now can i help you to do what you want to do but maybe in a bit more aware, aware uh, comprehensive outside in perspective that's that's my that's my hope but not uh, believing that i can move them to become you know the heir of the situation yeah. They should decide if they ever want to do that and it's not going to happen as the first step. But maybe getting this journey started is a good first step. Yeah. And you, you mentioned something there that stood out for me is the importance of raising awareness of where you are. Because that's been my experience too. It's uh, just starting by asking the question, where are you? What's happening around you? 
what's good enough, what might not be good enough. How would you describe that? Check with others to see whether they see it the same way and if they don't learn from each other so you get a higher resolution understanding of the environment that you're in and the, and the challenges and opportunities you face. And out of that comes the, the realization of where they might wish to invest energy into change and the question how then should we go about doing it and so it, yeah. it's not the 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 kind of polarity approach to that is the consultant comes in makes an analysis and said you need to do this this and this yeah maybe not even saying why yeah, yeah. and uh, and the flip side is you go in and say well take a look at what you've got and facilitate a conversation that leads to the realization of things to change and and then ideally supporting that process of, of discovery uh, among stakeholders so that they can and determine ownership. that's yeah. to me that's the big difference so i'm coming from a traditional consulting background and i really s always struggled with that with the idea that okay you are the expert mm -hmm. you come here you tell us where we are and you tell us where we should go from a to b mm -hmm. without ever having any experience of the system it's yep. crazy and I it agree. really the realization has been that uh, clients are expecting it. Yeah. Oh, we are paying you. You're an expert. Now, come here, bring your bag, and yeah, let us do what you believe. No, I'm not going to do that because I don't know your environment as you do, maybe. Mm -hmm. But even if I had that answer, that answer would be rejected by the system <laughs> because at the end, there is no way some external force can convince human beings to do mm -hmm. what uh, he or she believes so yeah, well maybe end, you can uh, conv you can convince those that resonate most with it but you're going to polarize the system yeah um, but that's a trick so at the end mm -hmm. uh, for me the, the most important step regarding less of the of the destination is making the system aware about the ownership and the responsibility that mm -hmm. the system has to take about itself yeah i don't know where it is going to, to go, but you have the ownership, not a consultant, uh, uh, not a book, uh, not Spotify. You must have the ownership. So you need to be willing to learn, to try, to fail, and to mm -hmm. move ahead. To me, this is the most important thing that uh, consulting may bring. That means it's a different kind of consulting. It's not sure. uh, you know, a solution. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's uh, enabling learning organizations, right? I yeah. Think. yeah. Yeah, I call myself an ex-consultant these days because it doesn't it doesn't seem compatible with S3. You know, it's a, it's a complete contradiction. Uh, it's really supporting people who want to learn how to better help themselves. I think would would be a way to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got about ten more minutes, I think, on our scheduled time. On the topic of S3, is there anything else you would enjoy to dig into or reflect uh, on yeah i would be interested to learn a bit about uh, yeah your last point um, what are you doing to help organization so at the end uh, what is really your goal in doing this is mm -hmm. it about uh, exploring the principles and then exploring the patterns is it uh, just energizing them or is it working with them to do something with the partner patterns and i'm very curious because at the end you have a quite an extreme view because of how s3 works in respect to any other model mm -hmm. uh, so i'm curious about yeah how you see yourself as an ex-consultant let's say what's your yeah. <laughs> mission or purpose in the world yeah well there's a few different levels to answer that question and i think i could start with personally so I, I believe that as human beings, we have enormous potential. And what we see manifest in the world today is extraordinary and shouldn't be underestimated at all. And at the same time, relative to what's possible is but a poor reflection of our potential to manifest awesomeness in the world and with the world, you know, in, in a way that's kind of coherent and complementary and regenerative with the environment that we're in. And, and we're a long way off regenerative practices of engagement with our environment, I would say. Um, it's not that environment is a, is a key driver for me. It's like, I think the, the earth will be just fine without us. It will recover and carry on. Um, 
but it's and we should certainly be stewards to the environment that supports us but it's more about our potential to extend our consciousness beyond ourselves individually beyond our families and communities beyond our species to a to a, a global level and recognize our potential to to create synergies and and develop in a in a in a yeah, it's not just sustainable it's in a re regenerative way yeah. um, I came across permaculture many years ago you know and permaculture is just extraordinary science it's so deep it's, it's beyond the, the depth of it is beyond anything any one individual could grasp but looking at how systems interact together and then consciously and intentionally interacting with that system to get more value out you know than, than you you kind of put in somehow and in a way that's sustainable over time so i'm really fascinated about that topic and um i think we've we've potentially got many thousands of tens or hundreds of thousands of years ahead of us as a species to explore that topic um so on the other side of that is my concern that despite that potential we could really screw it up <laughs> we've we we have an increasing impact through our activities in the world today um and like i say the world will be fine over time there's a few exceptions to that we could really screw it up i guess but the question is whether we will be and that concerns me greatly um and if i look at human organization it came about as a evolutionarily speaking as a way for us to better meet our needs and doing everything alone you know we, cooperation was an evolutionary step for us um and so i see organizations as existing to uh, to meet human needs and some organizations exist to meet some human needs more than others and that's fair enough to a point as well you know um but there's a kind of line and um and another dimension to this is seeing that people take responsibility in circumstances where what they're engaged in is meaningful to them and it seems that there's quite a big gap sometimes between the meaningfulness of a particular organization and the people that are working towards creating value within that organizational system and i think that we would do well to kind of align that a little bit more over time so there's a greater number of people engaged in meaningful activity in organization um, because i think that will increase responsibility and i also think it will increase kind of value creation within those organizational systems and when i came across uh, sociocracy many years ago this was in 2001 one thing that struck me about my very limited understanding of what it was at that time was that it was inviting a conversation um, between stakeholders um, where on the one hand each individual was invited to bring their fullness and what they had to contribute and at the same time they were also agreeing to hold back on trying to come down on in their particular on their particular position and hear others too and through doing so kind of agreeing to hold the tension between apparently irreconcilable opposites sometimes and out of that polarity a whole emerges that's greater than the sum of its parts so it's kind of like embracing polarity um transcending duality to give birth to something that's greater than any one of us alone and that that struck me as awesome you know i i, I I was working around that kind of process internally, you know, as an individual or with clients at the time. I was practicing as a, a therapist and uh, facilitating people's internal process of disidentification with particular positions within their system and then embracing other aspects of themselves to kind of engage life in a more kind of integrated way somehow. But I saw sociocracy facilitated that within a within a, a team context or an organizational context too um, and i think that that's uh, quite fundamental because as a species where we struggle most is polarizing on the basis of values you know? 
within ourselves, within our immediate relationships, but also more widely on the, on the, the, the social, social societal level and on the global level as well. And, and it seems most of our suffering is self-generated as a consequence of identification with certain positions and polarizing with others. So uh, sociocracy in general gave a very kind of pragmatic way of introducing the notion of showing up and also allowing others to show up and the idea of synergy um, between seeing myself as a contributor to a greater whole rather than seeking to be the one who kind of uh, defines the whole so yeah the last thing to say on all of that my background was coming more from a focus on human relationships and facilitating conversation, meaningful conversation, looking directly at conflict and finding ways to transform that into opportunities to learn and grow. And retrospectively, I would say it's very easy for that kind of inquiry to become quite indulgent and for not much to get done meanwhile. And uh, these days I'm much more on the of the opinion that most conflict actually in organizational systems comes down to the fact that people aren't so able or they're, they're just not so effective at organizational management you know there's there's just problems with that and they're not so effective at harnessing the fuller potential of the stakeholders who are involved and if you can facilitate conversations and introduce some practices that support that to happen more effectively then you radically diminish the amount of interpersonal conflicts and challenges that exist which leads to increasing psychological safety which leads to people being more comfortable to show up and combining that with a an environment that's meaningful and engaging to start with then you really start to energize the potential in in human organizational systems i really like your journey because at the end you started more from the individual side at someone doing that professionally and then eventually you got into the systemic side so at the end uh, the thinking that uh, human beings are human beings good or bad uh, but at the end we are human beings and some dynamics uh, shouldn't be regulated but should be helped and supported by some uh, infrastructure not in technological terms but mm -hmm. in uh, decision making uh, um, way and uh, I think this goes really at the core of this huge polarization in history between the the, the high, so the ego, and at the end the the the, the we, or mm -hmm. it could be the eco. So the the world, the team, the family, the organization, wherever. I think uh, this is really a so important step, and we are seeing it playing out uh, at any level. Mm -hmm. It's family, but it's also politics right now. It, it's really the, the, the world, and uh, maybe it goes beyond that. I yeah. think today we don't have the tools, and that's, that's what uh, really inspires me. Uh, yeah. I think we don't know even about what we have. And decision-making is a good example. At the end, everybody believes that it's the boss deciding or it's everybody deciding these are the two polarities and the two only options it's false at the end we have many many more so thinking uh, and practicing uh, this in-betweenness at the end this 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 continuum of opportunities and being aware of uh, your option and uh, being comfortable applying the options it's so important not just at the organizational level but at the really uh, economical level at the societal level at the individual level it's something that we are not used uh, of to me, this is very important, and uh, it's uh, it's comforting to to hear it from you because at the end, I'm coming more from uh, a team perspective or an organizational perspective, and I always wondered, okay, but uh, is there anything we should do at the individual level, the click mm -hmm. that should happen at the individual level to make this work at the organizational level? So what mm -hmm. I'm hearing from you is, yeah, you need both but uh, just working with individuals is not enough. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Maybe one last thing just on that topic of, but we say it's not either or, it's both and more. Um, yeah. And the me and the we, because 
there's a pretty big polarization in the world right now politically like you say on this me and we on uh, nationalism globalism and um you know, it's not it's not so evident to a lot of people that it it's about both um, you want to free people up as much as possible to be able to decide and act for themselves within coherent enabling constraints right that ensure that what's happening doesn't create decimation and destruction somewhere else and when there's dependencies or impact that those conversations can happen and adaptation can occur and we're in a very infantile stage right now in terms of doing that in a conscious way and it's extremely complex <laughs> for sure um but uh yeah i see this polarization of um individualism and um collectivism somehow we know neither of them work out particularly well and it seems to me that we're at this uh, this moment when we're being invited to kind of transcend that and develop a, a more kind of triune worldview. I, I quote almost without fail in introductory courses on S3, Rumi, who said, beyond right and wrongdoing, there's a field, I'll meet you there. Um, and, uh, and I also quote Ken Wilber often on saying that nobody's smart enough to be 100% wrong. And some people are more <laughs> correct than others some of the time, you know. And um, for me, that really speaks to the, the kind of sovereignty and the value of the individual, but it also invites humility and the recognition of the value within each individual. And that, you know, sometimes we're more or less on the button, on the page, correct in the context and so on. Um, and thinking about complexity, we really need to be able to harness the grains of value you know the essential value in all of the different positions and synergize that together because that's what's going to ultimately help us to make smarter decisions and and achieve our greater potential together i love that so i, I will conclude on this because i totally agree and uh, to me this is really the, the the purpose of what we are doing so it's not just doing projects or transformation initiative there is much more than that and uh, we need that as a as a species right now and where would people find you just so we can have this on the record for the video so uh my blog is www.socialenterprise.it um and that's yeah that's that, that's my 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 place let's say or the place from which i'm launching some conversations but yes i'm interested into the conversations Great. Okay, Thank man. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you. Have a nice day.